This week we're looking at the second version of the Cobra Battle Android Trooper. This is the second year in a row we've looked at the Cobra Bats. What's that? I know what that is. Last time I heard that sound I was attacked by bats. Eisenheimer kids think they're so funny. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This is the show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. We are in the middle of Cobra Convergence 5, G.I. Joe fans' celebration of G.I. Joe's enemy, Cobra. Before we get started, I have the privilege of giving a code name to a new patron. Silent Ghost added his support on Patreon. And this is another guy who already has a really awesome screen name. That makes it really hard to come up with a good code name. Your code name is Shadow Phantom. I can't give you anything cooler than what you already have. Thank you for your support. The Cobra Bat is a divisive subject in G.I. Joe. Some fans, like me, prefer the more realistic military aspects of the line, while other fans prefer the more science fiction and fantasy elements of G.I. Joe. Robot soldiers definitely fall on the side of sci-fi. Even so, the Cobra Bat wasn't the worst addition to G.I. Joe. Even hardcore military Joe fans have to admit, sci-fi was always part of the line. And a robot soldier wasn't that big of a leap from earlier science fiction elements. At least the first version of the Bat was a good action figure. It was well designed, it looked nice. Then there was a new version in 1991 and they did away with all that. But my opinion isn't the only opinion. Some of your Cobra Convergence 5 presenters will share their thoughts on this figure. HCC 788 presents the second version of the Bat. This is the 1991 Cobra Battle Android Trooper, the Bat. This figure was released in 1991 and was available in 1991 only. It was discontinued for 1992. This is the second version of the Bat in the vintage era. This body mold was used again in the post-vintage era in 2003, and there was a modern version of this figure in the 2017 G.I. Joe convention exclusive set. It was designed by Kurt Groen for Hasbro. There were there were only two versions of the Bat in the vintage era, but there were other figures that may be considered in the same lineage. In 1986, the first version of the Bat was released. The packaging didn't exactly say what the B-A-T stood for, but it was generally believed that it was an acronym for Battle Android Trooper. In 1991, we got the Bat version 2, and the packaging explicitly calls it a Battle Android Trooper. In 1992, Overkill was released in the Talking Battle Commander's subset, and he was billed as the Bat Leader, so he is definitely in the Bat lineage. In 1993, we got the Bat, that's B-A-A-T, which stood for Battle Armored Android Trooper, in the Star Brigade subset. It was an armored upgrade of the Bat, made to fight in space. The Bat wasn't the first introduction of science fiction into G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe had lasers in the first wave of the new G.I. Joe back in 1982. It did represent a big leap forward in science fiction for G.I. Joe. It wasn't the last sci-fi figure in the line either, not by a long shot. It ushered in a new era of fantasy and unrealistic elements in the G.I. Joe toy line. In 1986, the year the first Bat was released, there was also a composite clone Cobra Emperor, a new laser rifle trooper, and a mind-controlling mad scientist. Some fans loved these fantasy elements. For me, they were acceptable to a point, but G.I. Joe was, at its heart, a military toy line. 
It was called G.I. Joe, after all. It's impossible to separate that name from its military roots. This figure has several callbacks to the first version, but in some respects, it's a departure. We will compare and contrast as we go through each element. What is an android? The simplest definition is, it's a robot with a human form. A robot is a machine capable of carrying out complex actions. So, all androids are robots, but not all robots are androids. Modern robotics has made great strides, but not quite to the point of sending bipedal autonomous robots into battle. If Cobra could do this in 1986, and with an update in 1991, they were far ahead of the state of the art. Despite being engineering marvels, Cobra Bats were treated as disposable. I have the full card back for the Cobra Bat version 2, so we can see how this figure was marketed back in 1991. And the artwork, I have to say, is lackluster. It doesn't have any of the chest detail from the figure's lenticular sticker. This is in contrast to the card art from the first Bat, which had lots of detail and lots of drama. Just not so with version 2. It has the G.I. Joe logo and Cobra the enemy. It has a red background denoting this is an enemy character. Codename Bad, Battle Android Trooper. And then behind the space where the figure was packaged, it has instructions on how to use the arm attachments, the missile launcher, and the figure stand. Flipping the card around to the back, we have the cross cell with other figures that were available at the time. It does exclaim, Weapon Really Shoots. It has an 80s style flag point and an 80s style file card. Even though this was released in 1991, the back of the card was still in the 80s style. We will take a closer look at this file card later in this video. Let's take a look at the accessories for Bat version 2. It has some callbacks to version 1. For instance, one of the arms can be removed and other attachments can be put in its place. It goes about the storage of the extra attachments in a totally different way though, and the spring load missile launcher comes into play with that system. Let's start by taking a look at that removable appendage. This right hand all the way up to the forearm can be removed. There is a peg on the arm and it fits into a hole on the hand. That hand is in very bright orange plastic. The right hand uses the same basic design and color as the left hand and when it's removed on the spring-loaded missile launcher which can connect to the back there is a peg and that hand can be placed on that peg. This is the same basic idea as version one, which had a removable right hand. You could take the hand off and in the backpack, there was a peg so you could store the hand on the backpack. On a second peg on the missile launcher, there is another attachment. This is referred to as the grenade launcher. It pegs on in much the same way as the hand. You can pull it off of the missile launcher and you can put it on the peg on the arm in the same way the hand would fit on there. And now the bat has a grenade launcher attachment on his right arm. Now let's look at that missile launcher. It has a back peg, so it works as a backpack. It works pretty well, in fact. It is in black plastic. It has two pegs, one for the grenade launcher and the other one for the removable hand. It also has a hole so it can be attached to the bat's arm. That's how the bat carries it. It pegs onto his right arm on the same peg that holds the hand and attachments. This is a lot better than just having a grip on this thing that he probably couldn't hold anyway. Uh, this is actually pretty cool. I don't mind this. The missile launcher includes one very bright neon green missile. It's very bright, you can't miss it, and it only comes with one. That means we only get one shot at Dr. Mindbender. So let's use version one of Dr. Mindbender, since we already have him out. To use the missile, you just place the missile in the barrel of the launcher with this notch on the missile facing away from this notch on the barrel. You just press it in until it clicks, and then the trigger is in the back, this green trigger. So you just take aim, as we take aim at Dr. Mindbender, you pull back on the trigger, or actually push, looks like push down on the trigger. Okay, before I get started, uh, this is falling off of the peg, and I'm having a very hard time keeping this 
on the peg. So beware of that if you choose to get one of these figures. It's a cool idea to have the launcher peg onto the arm, but only if it stays well. All right, forget the figure. Just take aim at Dr. Mindbender and press back on the trigger to fire. That's a pretty powerful spring, and we would have knocked down Dr. Mindbender if he hadn't been standing so close to the back wall. The final accessory, which should never be forgotten, is the figure stand. This was a black figure stand. Uh, 90s figures came with figure stands, and 80s figures did not, so that's always a plus with these 90s figures. With the accessories out of the way, we can take a look at the articulation. He mostly had the standard articulation for G.I. Joe figures at the time. He could turn his head from left to right and look up and down. He could swing his arm up to the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow so he could bend his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. He had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around. This was an o-ring figure meaning the figure was held together with a rubber o-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. The additional articulation comes in when the hand is attached. That hand will swivel at that attachment point, adding a bit of articulation for the right hand. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of Bat version 2, and some elements of Bat version 1 are carried over, like the general shape of the face shield, and the black uniform, and the lenticular sticker. Many other elements have changed. Bat version 1 had one bright color, yellow, Version 2 goes overboard with the bright colors, adding a very bright neon orange and green. The new version also does away with the intricate sculpted technical details we saw on version 1. The head is black, it has an orange face shield, it has two green bands that go around the head, it has a single small green detail just at the forehead, this has minimal detail, and it lacks the Art Deco inspiration of version 1. On the chest, he has a black uniform with a green collar and an orange shoulder and chest guard. The green collar continues to the back, but the orange does not. The back does have some sculpted rectangles, which I guess are supposed to be panels. On that orange chest shield, there is a lenticular sticker that has a 3D effect and has some of the technical inner workings of the robot. The lenticular sticker is a carryover from version 1, but it is much smaller. It just is less impressive than the version 1 chest. It's a nice detail, but if they're going to do it, why not do it at least as good as the first version? Moving on to the arms, the figure has mostly black arms with some very minimal molded in detail on the upper arms. He has thin green bands that go around the upper arms, and he has bright neon green elbows. He has neon orange hands and forearms that look like gloves, and of course that's on the left hand. The right hand is uh, a separate piece that is removable and reveals a green peg under it. These arms are so much less impressive than version 1. Version 1 had metallic looking arms with molded in gears and hinges and circuitry, and on the left arm it had a cobra emblem. There's nothing like that at all on version 2. The waist piece has a ridged orange belt with a big buckle right in the front center and otherwise has no detail at all. The legs are black with some very minimal technical detail molded in. There are wide green bands that go around each thigh and he has tall orange boots. This ridge section at the top of the boot is a slight callback to version 1 that had a similar detail on his boot but that detail was painted silver and looked much cooler. In my review of Bat version 1, I talked briefly about why a robot would need to wear pants. In this case, the black uniform for version 2 seems more like a plastic or latex casing than a cloth uniform. It lacks the folded cloth detail of the version 1 figure. There's no doubt this is a bat. There are enough elements carried over from the first version to make it unmistakable. For me, though, it's missing the best elements of the bat. The robotic arms, the unique shape of the head, the pseudo-military feel of the uniform. Version 2 seems like a stripped-down version of the bat. 
Maybe the file card will give us some clue as to why that is. Let's take a look at the file card. The file card has the faction as Cobra, obviously, a portrait of the bat taken from the artwork on the front of the card. It says his codename is Cobra Bat, Battle Android Trooper. This paragraph says, Bats are totally artificial robotic troopers with extremely primitive logic circuits and very sophisticated targeting sensors. They can absorb enormous amounts of battle damage and still continue their missions as long as their trigger finger circuits are intact. Bats are usually deployed from low-flying aircraft without use of parachutes. This delivery system is normally quite demoralizing to opposing troops who happen to witness it. This paragraph would be true of version 1 bats. They were not especially bright, but they were very durable, and they could continue to fight even when a large part of the robot was blown away. This bottom paragraph says, The new bats, although upgraded in weapon systems, have been severely downgraded in logic and memory components components, which have been deemed unnecessary for what is now a machine gun with legs. And ironically, the bat does not come with a machine gun. The right arm can be replaced with a modular missile launcher capable of firing a wide assortment of ordnance. The basic model has three forward gears, no reverse option, and can be recharged from an ordinary household electrical outlet. The thought of thousands of bats at Cobra headquarters all plugged into one big extension cord is hilarious to me. Version 2 of the bat is a downgrade, if anything. They are dumber than the first version version. Looking at how the bats were used in G.I. Joe media, in the cartoon series they first appeared in Arise Serpentor Arise Part 1. They were formidable, but they couldn't withstand an attack by Sergeant Slaughter. In that episode, Scrap Iron is seen assembling bats. This has led some fans to believe Scrap Iron created the bats. Later in that episode, though, it is implied that Dr. Mindbender created them. The version 2 form was used in the Deke era of the animated series. I don't know what else to say about their appearances in cartoons. They were robot soldiers, is pretty basic, and not very unique in animation, as other cartoon series also had robot armies. In the comic book series published by Marvel Comics, the bat first appeared in issue number 44 and was on the cover. It was unambiguous that they were created by Dr. Mindbender, and they were used to attack a squad of Joes that was on a training mission. There were some Cobra battle robots earlier in the series, as early as 1984. In issue number 28, some Cobra uniformed, remotely controlled robot troopers are seen. Are they precursors to the bats? It's impossible to know, but maybe. The bats were well used in the comic book series in the late 80s. They were undeniably science fiction and not realistic, but Larry Hama used them to good effect. The bats were smart enough to drive cars and follow simple orders. They were also durable, continuing to attack even when they were busted to pieces. The second version of the bat was seen in the comic too. They were part of Cobra's attack on G.I. Joe headquarters in issue number 130. They were deployed by being kicked out of a hovering helicopter. Although the comic book has a reputation for being more realistic than the animated series, even in the comic they got a little crazy with the robots. For example, in issue number 132, the Joes encountered some amazingly tough robots that were smarter and stronger than the standard bats. In issue number 146 to 148, G.I. Joe Star Brigade and the October Guard encountered an army of robots defending an asteroid on a collision course with Earth. The field of robotics in the G.I. Joe universe was much more advanced than it was in the real world. Robots were treated as disposable, even when we would have considered them sophisticated, advanced, and expensive. Now, please welcome your Cobra Convergence 5 presenters to share their thoughts on version 2 of the Cobra Bat. To me, while the Bat version 2 is a really well done action figure, I still prefer the clunkiness of the design of the Bat version 1. It just has those classic robot looks. However, in its favor, I will say the Bat version 2's really sleek aesthetic really reminds me of the carnival robot from Scooby-Doo. Or maybe that's just me. Thanks, Hoodie. It's great to converge with you on this video. Bat version 2 was a fun, yet brightly colored update to the classic Cobra Battle Android Trooper from 1986. It really is hard to make an amazing version 2 of one of the best figures in the line. The updated Bat used all new parts. Hasbro liked the sculpt enough to recycle his legs and waist for the Street Fighter 2 figure Zangief in 1993. Why a Russian bear wrestler would have flesh-colored robo-legs is beyond me.
but that bat waist and boots work pretty well for his trunks and footwear. The problem is mostly those thighs. Hoodie doesn't count the Street Fighter 2 figures as part of the vintage G.I. Joe line, but the Street Fighter movie figures are definitely not part of G.I. Joe. I'd just like to point out that Hasbro didn't use the bat body parts for the movie Zangief. They used the bulkier road pig body. Much later, after the vintage era was over, we lived in a weird time that consisted of a mix of new sculpt G.I. Joes and repaints of O-Ring figures, Hasbro revisited the Bat version 2 sculpt to put out a Bat version 4 and Inferno Bat. These figures were part of an internet exclusive set that included three Bat version 4s, two Inferno Bats, and a repaint of the Bat Leader Overkill. Bat version 4 was the Bat 2 sculpt in a paint scheme more reminiscent of Bat 1, while the Inferno Bat was made of translucent red plastic. Both internet exclusive bats came with repaints of the Bat version 2 hand attachment, a grenade launcher attachment, and figure stand. No spring loaded firepower this time. I think Bat version 4, with the subdued paint scheme, really shows off how cool the 1991 Bat really is. Bat version 2 was my Bat version, okay? To put this in perspective, my very first G.I. Joe comic was bought for me by my brother. It was issue 130 of the original run. Those of you who think that is an obscure comic wouldn't be wrong, but it did feature the bats in an assault on the pit in Utah. And these bats version 2s were dropped out of Cobra transport helicopters as per the file cards. And from that day onwards, I always played with my Bat V2 in that fashion. It was always dropped from a helicopter, kicked out of the cargo door. Um, some of them were damaged, some of them were totaled, but the ones that were still combat effective were enough to overrun G.I. Joe. I only had one, so he was doubling up, he was tripling up, he was playing double, double duties um, to overrun the Joes, so to speak, just kind of recycling this figure. But hey, who didn't? I mean, army building in the 90s? Come on. <laughs> Love this figure. I really do. The uh, clip for the Bats version 2, which is a... It's an okay figure. You know, I had, I had it when I was a kid. You know, but uh, I actually don't like it as much as I like the original. Because the original bat is the is the most awesome of the group, but uh, version two is alright. It's good as army builder, you know. It's good as fodder for the bats version one to go out on a on your cobra missions. That's how I used to do it as a kid. But uh, it's a great secondary figure to the original bats and a good setup for it. But uh, that'll work, you know. But the bats version two, if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. But uh, I rate it as a middle tier figure myself. Looking at the Bat version 2 overall, I do not like it very much. The original Bat was not realistic in any way, but it had some things going for it. It had a good design, it had good sculpting, it had cool colors, it had a unique lenticular sticker. The sculpting on the hands and the arms was intricate and technical. It was a cool figure, even if it didn't fit my preferences. Version 2 does away with most of that. The sculpting is much more basic. It looks like he has human musculature rather than gears and circuits. The head is very human-like with a face mask. He doesn't look very much like a robot. With version 1, at least you could tell he was a robot. With this guy, as long as the arm is attached, could just be a guy in a suit. The base color is still black, which is a good start, but the other colors are as obnoxious as they could possibly be. Now, the yellow on the first bat wasn't exactly subdued, but it wasn't neon either. Since we're talking about a robot, an attachable missile launcher seems like a good idea. Except on mine, it has a hard time staying attached. And did the missile absolutely have to be neon green? Even the lenticular sticker is downsized. Version 2 has one, but it's smaller and less impressive. That's what you get when the 90s happens to an 80s figure. I know the 1991 Bat has fans. I hear from them. I hear you guys talking about this figure. For me, though, it doesn't hold a candle to version 1. I will say one positive thing about it. It's much cheaper to army build than version 1 Bat. Much cheaper.
much, much cheaper. That was my review of Cobra Bat version 2. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Silent Ghost, aka Shadow Phantom, for your support. And thank you to the Cobra Convergence 5 presenters who you saw in this video. Coming up next for Cobra Convergence 5, today on August 16th, you will get an entry by Mate Mylar. On August 17th, you will get Fun School Ronnie. On August 18th, you will get Joe Motion Videos 82. On August 19th, you will get JLS Comics. On August 20th, you'll get What's on Joe Mind podcast. On August 21st, you will get Articulated Points. And on August 22nd, you will get Green Yeti 907. Thank you for watching. I'll be back next week with another Cobra review. And until then, remember, only Cobra is Cobra.